Listen to the words very carefully, because eventually you'll get to know that it wasn't just a drawing, but it was also a life lesson, okay? And you say, Thank <laughs> you. 
once was a little boy, born on July 30th, 1931, on Niagara Street, not very far from here. <coughs> Across the backyard was a city abattoir steeped in the summer heat. Around the corner was a city incinerator with a smoke scatter, spewing smoke and garbage into the air. A mean little street, a narrow little house. In the house was a woman about to give birth. It was six o'clock at night, very hot. She fed the children and chased them out of the house. Beg, I did, beg, I did. When her husband came home from work, she set him off to get the big one. She held on the kitchen table. And just as she would do in the old country, she crouched down. <laughs> and a little baby was born out of the lonely floor. Without a boob in a chair. When the midwife arrived, she took the kitchen knife from the table and cut the umbilical cord and tied it up. Duck your sheep. Let it live for you. Who bit it, Little Buck. All boys and girls are, have the same name when they're born. Little Buck. Because we don't know if they will survive. One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. Child to call the coon, the godfather to give it a name. A Christian sons of the church. Gospel di Pomilo, Gospel di Pomilo, Alexander. So naked, so vulnerable, so dependent, with such a great future and such a magnificent past. <laughs> One day he'll want to know who he is. <laughs> What stories his grandfathers can tell him about who he is. Grandfathers? He has 28 grandfathers, each 80 years old, stretching back to the time of King Philip of Macedon. Philip, 
Macedonia and Macedonians are mentioned 27 times in the Bible. I don't know which kind of one. His grandfather will tell him about King Constantine, who was born in Nice, very near present day Skopje. King Constantine, the first Christian emperor who established the city of Constantinople. His grandfather will tell him about the two Macedonian twelves, St. Cyril and Methody, who invented the Cyrillic alphabet to translate the New Testament, bring Christianity to Eastern Europe, on into Ukraine, and on into Russia. And about the university that the people of St. Clement built at Oakland a thousand years ago in the fresco painted in the monasteries and the churches. There was a Macedonian Renaissance that predated the Renaissance of Italy in the Western world when a light to shine through in the darkness. It's 500 years of darkness. <coughs> His grandfathers and grandmothers can tell him how they survived for five years under the Ottoman Empire. Without books, without schools, without universities, without the chance to grow and develop. Learning from each other the only way they could, from Colonel to Colonel. Twenty-five generations. Survive and preserve our Macedonian heritage. Then, which grandfather will tell him about Eden and a 1903 walking through the hills of Krishabal and tell him about how the Macedonians rose with their declaration of independence and how they were defeated and subjugated for another 10 years? 1912, 1918. The good neighbors with the help of the Greek force <coughs> tear Macedonia apart. When the silk can be baked over the fires of our own lives, they took it away to strange cities, and in their own lives they carved it up. Families destroyed, brother son against brother. Names changed, our language forbidden. <coughs> People flee, hide, again hide, separate. But there's some unbroken magic, spiritual force that breathes life in the master, reminding us who we are that we're one people, one cloth, one order, wherever we are. His father and grandfather can tell him how a part of Macedonia emerged as a federated state in 1945, rising with new dignity, new schools, new books, new universities. Revitalizing the culture, rising like a small flame from those small, from those dark, burning embers. And how the struggle for other native lands continued until 1948. Another defeat when the great exodus occurred. Children, boys and girls, torn from their mothers, forced to run for their lives. Hiding in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary, in Romania. The 30,000 refugees, the federal sea, dispossessed and disenfranchised, but now grown up and educated. And some of them are with us here tonight. <laughs> Spreading the word like missionaries, telling our Macedonian story. Now, 1991, 8 million Macedonians telling our Macedonian story. Around the globe, like Alexander might have wished, having learned new languages, new customs, new traditions. In Europe, in Yugoslavia, in Bulgaria, in Greece, in France, in Germany, in Denmark, in Australia, throughout the United States, in Canada, and here tonight in Toronto. A little boy, he'll grow up, he'll learn, he'll learn that he was not born yesterday. He'll learn to be a Canadian, and he'll learn to say the Zdravie, and he'll learn to dice the oro, and the meaning of oro, that in times of crisis and joy, we cross the troubled waters like a great chain through time and space. He'll learn, Dadi Miraka, give me your hand, take my hand, give, receive, share, join, oro, zagendo, and celebrate and live. And when people ask him who he is, he'll say, I'm a Canadian. And they'll say, yes, where did 
your people come from. You'll say from Macedonia. And if they say, where's Macedonia? You'll say Macedonia's in here. It was 1991 at the Metropolitan Toronto Convention Center, the John Bassett Theatre, he blew them away. I asked him to do, um, you'll have to excuse me, there'll be a lot of this today. I asked him to do 2,000 years of Macedonian history in 12 minutes. He said, I can't do that, there's too much. And in rehearsal, about halfway through, he stopped and he sat on a cold linoleum floor. We were on a few levels down at the Canadian Macedonian place. I said, Alex, what is it? He said, you know, our history has so much suffering, so much tragedy. I'm finding it hard to express the glory. He said, do you know? What happened after the Illinden uprising? The, the carnage, the burning, the rape, and our people running into the mountains to a harsh, harsh winter with only their oil. Do you know? And do you know? And it goes on and on. And finally, the irony hits him. The fact that he says, here I am, weeping sitting on a cold linoleum floor at Canadian Macedonian Place. I was born on a cold linoleum floor on Niagara Street, down the street from the abattoir. And he gives me that, that wry smile. And he gets up and he snaps his fingers. Hi there, let's go. And that's what we ended up. And at that moment, it seemed that he became 2,000 years old. It seemed that he could gestalt that entire Macedonians, he had that magic, and he could cut through cultural boundaries and intellectual disciplines and social caste systems. He had that ability, and he was also a wonderful actor, which made it very difficult for me to be with him. <laughs> he just had it all. Oh, by the way, my name is John Evans, and I want to thank you for coming here. I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, I want to thank Canadian Macedonian Place. I want to thank Canadian Macedonian Historical on behalf of uh, Virginia Evans and I, uh, uh, Canadian Macedonian Historical Society, and particularly the Stoyanovich family who allowed us to invade their privacy over the last few months. So let me just tell you that a few hours later, after that, and a few glasses of wine. We were sure that Alexander the Great loved to be called Alex because of the X at the end. And that was the beginning of the Euro, Alex. And we knew that not only Cleopatra was Macedonian, but the entire Ptolemy dynasty knew that. <laughs> and we knew that every word that begins with M-A-C began during, with the Macedonian language. Isn't that right, Barry? <laughs> and also, this is true, he said. 
Alexander the Great, while he was conquering the known world, would teach the pagan tribes two incredible ideas for the time. He taught the first thing was, don't kill your parents, foreshadowing the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, that's 500 years before. And don't sleep with your daughters, the beginning of feminine liberation, women's liberation. And this is 400 years before Christianity. So he would glory in that. But let me tell you why we call it uh, Alex Jigorov One Oro. We were at the Sky Dome. I'll just have to skip ahead here. Uh, we were at the Sky Dome. Um, that's the National, uh, that's the Metropolitan Convention Center. And that's us drinking. Well, it's not me, but it's. <laughs> here we go. Um, and that's the thank yous that I was supposed to click. There we are. We're at the Sky Dome. Uh, 1992, uh, John Beethoven and, uh, and Stan Thomas and Chris Pallier, they rented the field of the Sky Dome for a fundraising event for uh, Macedonia because they'd just been suffering some terrible floods in Skopje. There were about a thousand people there, and it was got very, very exciting. I want a thousand, I give a thousand dollars for my grandson, I'll give five hundred dollars on the name, and it got very, very heated. And the music got loud, and there were three oros. There was one on the pitcher's mound, and there was one at shortstop, there was one at right field, and we were on a stage uh, just below, a big stage underneath the jumbotron. And Alex comes running up the steps onto the stage, and the music is loud, everybody's having a great time. John, this has got to stop! It's wrong, it's no good, it's not us! There's three oros out there! It's got to be one oro! Uh, Alex, uh, uh, okay, uh, what, what do you want me to do? Stop it! I said, Alex, I can't stop this. He grabs the mic out of my hand and he starts walking across the stage. Stop! One auto! Everybody together! It's so good. It's our survival. It's the reason why we're still here. It's why we exist. It's one. And he realized what he was listening. He couldn't hear him. They thought he was dancing. <laughs> and I tried to rationalize. I went up to Alex. There's three regions. It's the Pyrrha and the Gia and it's the Barter and it's okay. You, see, you don't understand. And he's about two inches from my face. And his sweat is pouring down his face and his eyes are wild and his hair is angry. He has angry hair. <laughs> he says, Nenas Beerus, Nenas Beerus. I says, Nenas Beerus, Nenas Beerus, Nenas Beerus, I said, you don't understand. He says, I, I understand, Alex. He says, you don't understand. You understand it here. You don't understand it here. He did that. And he walked away swearing in Macedonia. I won't repeat what he said. But that's the kind of passion that, uh, that uh, we connect with Alex. He just brought you right into the moment. You think you know someone. You think you have friends and you know them. And then one day you look beyond the eyes and into that other world, that other universe, and you realize that, oh my God, I, I don't think I know this person. And that's what happened to Alex as I rediscovered him on this, on this journey. T.S. Eliot said it very well. He said, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to end where we started and know the place for the first time. So on this journey, I met uh, the two nephews of, uh, of Chris, of Alex, uh, Chris and Dawn, and I spent a day with Chris, hovering lovingly over the family album. Oh, there's Bob and Dan. Oh my goodness, look at that. Oh, that's Alex Music Team, and that's where he's, oh my God. Uh, Chris uh, scanned most of the images that uh, you see here, if I can catch up. Um, now that's the flood <laughs> to the wall. Anyway, I've met some wonderful people, and I, one of them is uh, Chris, Chris Stoyanovich. Come on up, Chris. Uh, th this cap uh, has huge significance. Uh, for more reasons than one. 
Um, I really had to follow that man uh, my entire life. Um, on, on behalf of my family, especially Andre, where's Andre? Put your hand up. Who I'm now getting to know again, um, Alex's son. And my mother, Vera Stoyanovich, is, who is here proudly today to see her late brother and her lifelong best friend, and you have to underline that, lifelong best friend, celebrated. Um, I thank you for your attendance and interest in my uncle's life. And like John, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and all of the sponsors. Canadian Macedonian Place, Jenny Evans, thank you, Jenny. Another friend of Alex and, and uh, running the Canadian Macedonian Historical Society who will kindly accept donations to help promote the idea of Macedonian history and Macedonian life. And then finally, John, who I've met before, but he and I reacquainted ourselves as we went over photo after photo and albums that uh, Andre had, uh, had sent down. And uh, perhaps that's the best place for me to start today, um, reviewing the photos page by page. Uh, excuse me. Uh, with John, started to peel back the layers in my own life. Uh, the early photos, Gillespie, 6 Gillespie, um, after Niagara Street, after that, that little street and the little rope, sorry, it disappeared. Oh, sure, I can, I can, I'm never asked to, uh, to not speak loudly. My wife will testify to that. So I'll speak into the mic. Um, the early photos of him um, at 6 Gillespie, uh, my dead old Baba's home in West Toronto, um, that um, uh, Alex shared, or we shared for a time with Alex, uh, my late Aunt Anne and my cousin Diane um, later, really represents a very proud time in all our lives. As Alex, sorry, he won't have to remember to speak into this and not wander. As Alex said, um, a little row house on Niagara Street, about this wide, um, with an abattoir at the end of the street, and the city incinerator. And I heard stories about what it was like to live with other Macedonian families on that street, where children were born in their homes, as Alec, my uncle Alec described, on the kitchen table, on the linoleum floor. Um, but it represented a very proud time in my, my family's life. They were moving away from Niagara Street, and they now a, a new home on Gillespie. And like the family's move, Alex's life and academic career started to reflect that climb upward. Somewhere there's a picture of Alec uh, as uh, uh, student school president at Western Tech when he went there in, in the, in the, um, in the west, blue or west part of the city. Uh, these pictures that you see behind you, um, probably Diane and, and a few others, my mom will remember where they were taken. Um, graduation picture standing in front of a window was really a sun porch where Alec had his, had his office. It was off a bedroom on the second floor at Gillespie. Uh, John, if you can just roll back slightly, just the picture of the graduation picture with my dad Okida. That's one, yeah. And there's others there as well. Um, this was 1952 in this very campus. Um, my dad Okita, there's pictures there with my, with my mom. Another picture, uh, perhaps you can find it, John. Picture with my Baba Velika. Can you find it, John? Uh, keep going, maybe. No, we've lost it. No, okay, we've lost it. That was 1952. Um, and it represented it was a very proud and significant time in my, my family's life. It also rep represented a very significant fi financial sacrifice for his parents and his three sisters. Um, from there, his academic career, and most of you probably know it, uh, he, he, Osgood Hall Law Degree, um, subsequently a Master's in Criminal Psychology in the Clark Institute here at the University of Toronto, then a PhD from the London School of Economics in England, in the early 1970s. And when I told my high school friends in the 1960s, my, my, Alec, my uncle Alec was doing research um, in sexual practices, they seemed extremely interested at the time. Until I told them that 
sexual deviations in the criminal mind was one of his major theses. They were less interested at that point. Criminal law. Criminal law. Criminal law. And like some rich man's son, which he clearly was not, the photo albums reminded me of his, of his travels. And Mum reminded me that, you know, he, unlike a poor man's son, he looked at his, as, as himself as something extremely different. He, he, he traveled. He traveled to uh, England. He traveled to Scotland, to France and Italy and Macedonia. And it was in those travels, I'm sure, where he enriched his own life and his passion for the arts. There he is in his, in his famous kilt. And there's a story attached to that. He asked me last night, I was sleeping last night, and he said to me, Chris, ask the question, you know, what's a Macedonian Highlander wear under his kilt? I'll answer the question later. But he asked me, you know, that, you know, there, was, there was the philosopher Alec, but there was also the Alec that liked to, um, you know, twist things a little bit. And anyway, that's, that's a story. Um, but for the sake of time, let me just sort of cut to my own personal observations and experiences. There were trips, day trips to this university 60 years ago, Victoria College to, the long, uh, to Osgoode Hall, where he, my mother said, take your nephew to the University of Toronto, maybe he'll learn something. And away I went with him to meet his friends and his, and his fellow students, where he just opened up and, and hoping, you know, with a wide range of discussions, the discussions and topic of discussions, he hoped to transfer some of his experience and knowledge to his young nephew. Uh, my first solo weekend train trip, Mom will remember this, packed me off on the train to Whitby where he first practiced criminal law. And there, at 10 years old, he painted a family portrait that hung proudly in my family's home for, for over 50 years. And that's it, John, perfect. You know, I asked John to bring this photo up because as, as I was scanning those photos that day in my office with John, I said, um, you can already begin to see in this man's eyes and his demeanor that he, that he knew he wasn't going to be anchored behind a desk. That wasn't, that wasn't Alec Jigorov. He was never, never destined to be desk-bound, or he might be limited in, in, in terms of his personal point of view or his scope of work. You saw him on that stage. You know, the philosopher, the historian, the criminal lawyer, I mean, it was all wrapped up in one big bundle of energy, you know, and I rode on those coattails for 60, until he passed away this year, 67 years of my life. And there were always day trips to the art gallery where he loved, you know, to interpret for you what the artist was saying, you know, and, and what the artist was trying to express. He, what he wanted to do, and I don't know who, you know, how many other people in this room had those kinds of trips, but he, he wanted to open your eyes to all of life's possibilities as expressed by all the different artists. And then there was all, always telephone calls or kitchen table conversations, especially those with my late father, Don. Uh, two men, and I, and I had to mention my father here, uh, two men who really approached life from different ends of the spectrum. My father, born in 1921, 10 years before his brother-in-law, very traditional Macedonian family, um, uh, didn't have money to go to school, went to work. And my father took that philosophy, and uh, that was the thing that really um, uh, was the most important thing to him, about having a job. Having come here in 1935 in the middle of the Depression, a job was the most important thing. And there he had his brother-in-law, who well, I paint a little bit, I, 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 I talk to, I, I give lectures on Macedonian history, thanks, brother-in-law. Um, and the, on and on they went about, you know, the value of working and the value of not working and the value of being unlimited in terms of your scope or your interest in life or what you might say. That was Alec, that was my father. And talking to Alec was like some kind of an Olympic event. Intellectually, intellectually, it was a high jump. I'm sure many people had that experience. Desperately trying to keep up with them. The next idea. A boxing match. If you had a different opinion of him, even over the telephone, as John stared at you like, where are you coming from? What book did you read? Who are you quoting? You know, it was, we had those kinds of discussions. And then finally a marathon because it went on forever. At the kitchen table, on the telephone, trips to Yarmouth, trips to Ottawa. The discussions went on and on and on. <coughs> 
Someone, this is the tough part. Uh, someone once said, if you live long enough, life starts to take things away from you. Uh, we sadly lost my father almost three years ago, no Alec. But for me, there's no real ending here. Both men had a profound and lasting impact and will continue to have a lasting impact on my life. Alec always said, never ask me to take it easy or take care. Instead, ask me to live dangerously. And he did live dangerously at times. And Andre, I think, is going to speak to that. So he lived his life in his own unconventional way. And now the answer to the Scottish kilt story. So there I was. I'm going to step away from the mic. Uh, so there, there I was at one team. One night I was there, and we were all very well And as I left the party, um, I was waving goodbye to Alice. And he lifted up the tilt that he was wearing, and there was nothing under it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer to the question. <laughs> So, so, Alec, by now, I can imagine you've already upset a few people in heaven. Uh, you've, you've painted the gates to heaven in Macedonian colors with a starburst proudly displayed for all to see. And I'm sure by now you've convinced God that Macedonians are really the chosen people. Thank you. That was great. This next person does not need any introduction. Uh, she has, uh, for the last 40 years, absolutely interwoven herself into every, every organization. Somehow she knows what's going on. But what's specifically important for me to say is that when we did Oro Macedonsko in 1948-1984 at uh, Roy Thompson Hall, then we did 1991 at the Metropolitan Toronto Convention Center, and then to the Sky Dome, and then I think 1993, uh, for the first time ever that Canada recognized Macedonians as a significant uh, ethnic uh, minority in Canada, officially, we performed uh, with Alex at the uh, National Arts Center. None of those events would have occurred uh, without her help. She now runs the Macedonian uh, Film Festival, which is now in its 11th season and it has not been easy but easy is not in her dna she does things that are difficult because she has the passion for it. uh the film festival by the way october 22 23 at the carlton cinema go and catch it if you're interested it's uh, it's a good experience ladies and gentlemen jenny andreoff evans <laughs> much for coming today because really and truly this was really um, it's an honor for me to speak about Alex because he was just a he was really a, a, a special guy and it's appropriate to actually celebrate this man's life because he really uh, he affected a lot of people you know his words were like uh, well they're like skipping stones that send out ripples in the water you know you throw them out there and 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 it just kind of goes around and so he encouraged people to get out of their comfort zone. I reacquainted myself with Alex when I started to work on the Oro Makedonsko, which was in 1984 at the, uh, at, at, uh, Roy Thompson Hall. And, uh, and then more so at the Metro Convention Center, which was in 1991. So uh, he, he, could be, he could be serious and fun-loving and charming and stubborn. But there were so many parts to that man. I mean, it was sometimes overwhelming. He'd sketch someone 
uh, while uh, we might be down at the Danforth or, uh, or out to dinner. So he challenged me. That's what he did. That's what he really did for me. He challenged me to go to university. He said, you can do it. You're just as smart as anybody else that's there. And I thought, really? Okay. Well, they all seem smarter than I am. No, but in spite of my advanced years, uh, starting university at that time in my life was, uh, well, it might provide me a sense of worth, you know, maybe vocabulary, language. I even took Christina's Macedonian class when I was going, and confidence, and, and even another perspective in life. Well, it certainly wouldn't get me a better job, not at my age. I'd always wanted to go, but it was not a high priority, as earning a living was more important. I guess it was at the back of my mind some time to go, and even after I married and had children for something, maybe I'd, I'd go and I'd do it someday. But you know, Alex made it today. I'll be forever grateful to Alex, as the years I spent going to York at night changed my life. He made me believe that I was capable, and that's important to me personally. He kept asking how I was doing and what are the subjects that I was taking and uh, sometimes I'd send him a copy of, my, of an essay. And then when I finally graduated with a BA from York University in 2001, he was here in Toronto to decorate my backyard with flowers and stravets on each table for a fabulous party that I had promised myself when I graduated. He led the oro and charmed all the guests. He's a great friend. I bugged him as well. I, I knew how to do that. And, uh, and because he needed to reprint his Macedonian children's book, Baba's Macedonian Socks, that's the one that is the only English language Macedonian children's book alive. And he became, for the second reprinting, he became his own publisher and we found a Macedonian printer who agreed to print it. Chris Stefanovic will tell you about the involvement of the Macedonian Canadian health professionals had on this project. By conquering university at my age, I guess I was able to affect my community by successfully starting a film festival and also writing about events that happen in the Macedonian community. Uh, and uh, getting them published in uh, both, both Macedonian newspapers. I'm honored that he has given me the responsibility of publishing his unpublished manuscript of Macedonian folk tales, which he called uh, Tales by uh, Dedo Kire, and it's called The Bells Are Ringing. I hope that I can measure up to his expectations by having these tales published in the future. I know that he loved them. I knew that any time we're able to publish a text, write a story, write our own history, put on a play, screen a film that is Macedonian and is in English for the world to enjoy, it's a win-win for us. And he knew that as he was always writing opinion places, opinion pieces, plays, poetry, you name it. Alex would have loved this. He really would have. He would have been this, in the center of this and holding court. And now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Chris Stefanovic, a beloved family doctor to his patients, Canadian Macedonian place board member, and a lover of all things Macedonian. He's also the past president of the Macedonian Canadian Health Professionals and also a great friend of Alex's. Thank you. Um, I think I will be honored to wear this hat for a little bit. Um, and I guess the one thing is, in getting ready for today's event, uh, one of the things that my wife completely uh, could not understand was I said, I'm going to wear a very colorful shirt and my Macedonian colorful socks, which for those of you who know me 
it is totally not me. I'm very conservative, very quiet, very black and white, and that's it. So, so uh, I think the presence of Alex in this room has contaminated me and made me feel very energetic. So thank you. Um, one of the things that I will uh, just mention at the very beginning is that uh, Ginny is, um, um, by the way, Virginia is my uh, first cousin, and uh, she's my, I guess you would honestly say, is my surrogate sister. And uh, she's involved me a lot in, in a lot of Macedonian functions, and first introduced me to Alex in 1984 with Oro Makedonsko, then Oro Makedonsko in 1991. Uh, that's when we started developing a, a relationship with Alex. Um, I loved his book that uh, some of you may have seen. It's the uh, book of uh, learning the Macedonian language. The alphabet is not quite what's in, in the Republic of Macedonia, but it still is a very fun book. And I still remember, of course, the one page that is the, the one that I still remember, my wife and I still, Pasilka and I keep using that phrase, uchi uchi ti papuchi, when we were talking about certain things, particularly when you're dealing with children. And uh, the other thing was that Alex had his first book published in uh, 1993, that was Baba's Macedonian Socks. When, when he published that book, I was very enthusiastic about it. Again, it was thrilled to see things in paper and print. It's uh, very important to have this uh, uh, recognized. And, and as a result, uh, I purchased a number of these books. And what I did was, in, in my own practice, I kept at least one or two of them in my office at all times in the waiting room. So I practiced in Etobicoke. We had a group of six or seven doctors at the time. I think we contaminated central Etobicoke with Macedonianness, uh, compliments of Alex. And uh, I told Alex about that. And I, in fact, uh, called him and spoke to him. And I said, I need some more books because the others, they, they seem to walk away. They get stolen, whatever. And I don't care. I just want them to be circulated. And Alex said, well, the first publications are all gone. There aren't any more left. And um, so then uh, Virginia um, and I started talking to him a bit. Virginia, of course, is a much better bugger than I am. And she bugged him for about 10 years. And then, of course, the issue was, OK, I will redo the book, but uh, in fact, there's a picture here from his book, um, but I don't have the financing for it. And then I said, well, I'll finance it. He said, no, no, it's too much money. You've got to share the load with other Macedonians. It should not be just a one-person thing. It should be a group thing. Zayeno. And that's his concept. And uh, so as a result, I went back to some of the other uh, physicians and uh, doctors in our uh, uh, Macedonian Canadian Health Professional Association, which started in 1991, and uh, asked for donations from other members. Uh, one of the other members is here, Dr. Dan Mallon. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dorothy Markle, my, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, also gave a donation. We also had the Canadian uh, restaurateurs um, with Angelo uh, Argiro uh, donating. And of course, I also bugged CMP. Now, I'm on the board of CMP, and, and, and I may take it upon myself to speak on behalf of CMP. Uh, and the president, uh, Marilyn Trentos. But uh, we have been thrilled with Alex's contributions to CMP over the years. You can see in the pictures that his murals on the walls uh, basically are making the whole front lounge of CMP a very lively area. In addition to that, uh, a couple of years in 2003, when uh, we were talking about establishing a, a nursing home uh, situation, with, uh, uh, with a partner. We asked, uh, asked uh, artists to decorate the walls of the new nursing home. And in fact, we asked the artists 
commissioned the artist to prepare paintings for this. And there's three of those paintings out front from CMP's collection that, uh, that Alex uh, had done. They were all based on food, which, which for those of you who know Alex, he enjoys. So enjoyed. And the, uh, the one thing is that uh, after we had the, the, mo the money collected for this, Alex then republished this book in, in uh, nine, 2009. Over the years, I've known Alex, uh, called him periodically. The one thing that is very important, and in fact, this is something that, uh, that I've always remembered with him, is he would always end his conversation with you in a positive note. You'd feel down. In the 1990s, I was very involved with the Medicine for Macedonia event. Um, and, and the campaign, and again in 1999 with the Kosovo crisis. Um, and uh, as you know, politics can drive you into the ground and make you feel a little bit tired and run down, but Alex, Alex would always cheer you up, and he would always end a conversation with a song, and he would always sing his song, which was, you know, Baba Niflet Shadini Chorapi. And I always remember that every telephone call was a positive feeling. You'd hang up the phone and say, I really am glad that I spoke to this, gen this man. So the one thing is, is that I think that one of the things that I wanted to, to share with, uh, with people here was a little email that he had sent. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, unfortunately, age catches up to you, and you need to use glasses once in a while. Hi everyone, this is from Alex. Life is for sharing, and sharing art is one of the happiest things of all. Painting is a way of communicating, and because one can never say everything at once, I feel a painting is a suggestion of what I feel life is all about. Things are alive, are always moving, and so much movement in one of the main ingredients of my life. For me, color is the music of painting, and so I reach to play on the whole keyboard of a grand piano. That is his philosophy. And, and I think the one thing is, is that we really need to uh, thank uh, Alex for opening up all of our eyes as Macedonians to the fun side of being a Macedonian with his splash of colors and the joy of singing. He was an eccentric Renaissance man that was always kept you on your toes when you talked to him. But one of the things that I want to really congratulate Alex on is that by publishing this book, he has given us the ability to read and enjoy being Macedonian to our grandchildren. And thank you, Alex. The first song I ever learned to sing in my life was from my mother never learned to speak English very well. But we used to sing songs all the time in the house. And she taught me this little song. Baba mi pleti share di chora pi. Baba mi pleti share di chora pi. Deli deli da inosam, deli deli da inchuvo. Deli deli da inosam, deli deli da inchuvo. No si, no si, vedo che te puli. No si, no si, vedo che te puli. And I loved that little song as a little boy. And of course, it was many, many years later that I learned what that song really meant. It's not a song about socks. It's a song about the beautiful things that our grandmothers knew 
uh, grandmothers made for us and loved us by making us these little socks. Your grandmother has given you beautiful things. She's made beautiful things for you. What will you do with them? Will you wear them? Or will you save them? Will you wear them? Or will you save them? And I always thought that was a question, a dilemma, whether you wear them or whether you save them. But the answer came, wear them, wear them. Your grandfather is watching you. We'll watch you. Your grandfather will watch you wearing those little colored socks. But it really isn't a question whether you wear them or whether you save them. By wearing them, you also save them. By showing what you are and telling who you are, you also preserve your heritage. So it's not a question of either this or that, but by doing both, that's when the thing lives. And your grandfathers, those river gods of the blood that still run through you with your genes and your, your biological makeup that's still in you, you know, they will watch what you do with your life and with your, whether you'll preserve and carry on the beautiful wisdom and the tradition and the love of Macedonians for each other and for all the rest of the world. Baba Mithati Share Nichorapi Baba Mithati Share Nichorapi Deli Deli Dainosam Deli Deli Dainchuvam Deli Deli Dainosam Deli Deli Dainchuvam Nasi Nasi Edo Kete Puli Nasi Nasi Edo Kete This next gentleman is just amazing. Um, we had uh, we had him over to my house uh, the other day, and my neighborhood will never be the same. Uh, he is a painter, a performer, a composer. Just a thrill of a person to be with. Uh, he studied in the finest schools uh, of New York, and rightly so. He told me he had an audition. I forget the name of the school, but they. They accepted him on the spot as a young man. And uh, you just don't know who you're going to meet when you're connected with Alex. Uh, he's obviously got the right gene pool. I want you to meet the son of Alex Zigarov. Would you come up, Andre? Ah, put the hat on. Put the hat on hide my balding head, right? I don't have my father's hair, unfortunately. <laughs> Chatsky, uh, please, a big hand for Chatsky. <laughs> I thought this would be uh, <clears throat> kind of easy to get through as I was thinking it through in my head, and, and I realize now how much more difficult it is. However, there are so many wonderful and people I don't know who knew my father that I feel I'm with family. So what happens will just happen. Um, we're going to sing a little, aren't we? Okay, so now, oh, wait a second. Nobody's offered my father a cigarette yet. <laughs> there you go, Jim. <laughs> you know what? When we, when we went to rehearse this song, uh, Chesky said to me, he goes, oh, you're singing really well, but he goes, the, the words, the words, they're, they're, they are words, but they're in the dialect of your grandparents. And I said, well, those are the only words I know. And he said, well, how, how about these words? And I looked and I said, Chesky, I'm singing this song for 40 years. I was singing it in the car when my, my dad would teach it to me. I, I remember standing on, on my ditto's little ottoman and singing for him. And Chesky said, well, there are words that are really kind of the, the more uh, words that are appropriate to the song. And I thought, okay, my father loved to learn and loved to learn right to the end. So I have tried to learn the song I've sung for 40 years in a new dialect. And so please forgive me if I have to kind of like cheat a little. Okay, okay let's go. Hey! Hey! Oh, in the heart of the 
from the old country. There's the Stravitz. Up here, let's put the Macedonian star. My father always insisted on some color. These are his paints. I've traveled with them all over the place. I've taken them to Venice and done watercolors. <coughs> Dee Dee, this is our little ball. Dad would always have bouquets of Stravitz on the table. And I'd say, Dad, that's a lovely bouquet. He said, yes, it's been there for months. Because the roots never die. They just grow and grow and grow. Am well, I doing good? Yes. I think that's enough. Wait, there's something missing. The little bird that my grandfather, my ditto, taught my, my father to draw, and my father taught me to draw, and I draw it a little different. It's a little bird of Macedonia telling you where to go. Go somewhere, do something wonderful. And of course, it's important because everybody needs to eat. So always put food for the bird. Can we bring your stool over this way? I feel you're too far away. Um, okay, so um, John said, uh, Andre, 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 please, please memorize what you're going to say. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a consummate actor, I've done uh, all kinds of shows, uh, there's no way I can memorize this. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's personal, and I'm going to try to tell you as personally and as beautifully as I can about some of my history with my father. I found it very difficult to choose words to describe somebody's life. If I were... Like a bird, I could chirp and tweet, and you would all understand what I was saying, and there would be no misconceptions or misinterpretations about what I'm saying. But what you have to know is that the words that I have chosen are 
like beads on a necklace, and strung through them all is the love for my father. Where to begin? Like my father, I was born, but not on the floor. <laughs> I was born in Wellesley Hospital downtown. Uh, my mother started going to labor, they rushed her into the hospital, my dad went down for a coffee. Twenty minutes later he came up and there I was. <laughs> Our life would be a marvelous journey together with colorful paths and bumpy bits and unexpected trails. Alex was a philosopher at his core. He used his writing and his art as a means to express his values and ideas. He found when a theme engaged him, it would give him great joy, and he wanted to share it with everybody. Sometimes he shared those ideas for 40 years, over and over, like a bell that will ring tomorrow. Repeat, 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 and variation. And in the repeating of the ideas, new understandings would come. It was ideas that excited him the most, and he loved the CBC radio. He had a subscription to Harper's Magazine that he read cover to cover 20 times every month. He kept himself educated right until the very end of his life. Growing up with this man was not always easy. He had a difficult married life. He divorced Vivian after 26 years of marriage, and he never remarried. It was bitter and nasty, and we all know how family things can divide us. But we don't do that. You see, after four years of darkness between my father and I, we were able to move on. My father taught me to engage with other people. I'm actually a shy and quiet guy, but we not. <laughs> but he taught me to be my true self all the time, to stand up for myself and be who I was. And so, he taught me to love the underdog and to be always immensely grateful for everything that I had. He encouraged me to go where interesting people were doing interesting things. And so imagine this little boy growing up in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, really at the very end of the country, going all the way to New York and studying at the American Musical Dramatic Academy. I, I, I couldn't believe it, I felt like a king. Can you imagine that little Macedonian boy as he walked past the gates of Osgood Hall and stared at the chandeliers and one day was able to grace through the gates and grow? I never understood why my father stayed in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. He was Macedonian. He was the lone wolf crying in the wilderness and yet his voice continued to reach out throughout the world. And it was in Yarmouth that he created a family that would take care of him and stay with him through the rest of his life. You always knew where you were in life with my father. There was never any question where you were. And you could always tell that by where you were on the speed dial on his phone. <laughs> Vera, you were always number one. be the beloved artist of Yarmouth, painting murals, doing hundreds and hundreds of sketches, portraits, paintings of landscapes and all different kinds of stuff. He loved to walk down the street because people would wave at him and honk their horn, stop it with him, tell them about their babies. <laughs> Every community needed their artists. My dad had a few regrets. And I think the biggest regret is that he was unable to foster a better relationship with my brother. My brother was also an extremely brilliant and talented, but difficult man. And enough said about that, but after my brother died four years ago, his philosophy of light as a feather became his mantra. He smoked too much. He drank too much. He argued too much. He had to challenge everyone and everything, which often pushed people away. He loved his rye whiskey, 
and his ginger, but he'd often become dark and verbally abusive after a few stiff drinks. And there are more than one person in this room who know what I'm talking about there. He loved to share ideas on how to live, although he almost never practiced what he preached. I think his publication of First Class Man was his own um, self-written, self-help book. He didn't enjoy playing games at all, but his mind was like a golf course. Taking assessments, calculating, trying to land that ball into a hole to get the idea right. He loved symbolism in the process of discovering, and when he discovered something for himself, oh boy, he shared his observations with everyone who would listen and everybody else who wouldn't listen. <laughs> Don't tell me to be safe, he'd say to me when I went out the door. Tell me to live dangerously. <clears throat> we are not yet as good as our human hearts that exchange the good and the bad with every beat. And most of all, make a nice day. Uh -huh. Dad was taken to Yarmouth Hospital with complaints of stomach pain. His intestines had twisted, and he went in for an operation. And unfortunately, they were able, they were able to remove the offending bit, but they weren't able to finish the operation. <clears throat> and so, while on life support that night, I brought in a CD player with Macedonian music on it. He was unresponsive, but his eyes blinked, his toe twitched. And at 2 a.m. in the morning, in ICU in Yarmouth, I plugged in that CD player, and I turned on that CD, and it was set at dinner volume, <laughs> all the way through ICU, Macedonian music rang out. He followed that music all night long. And in the morning, I had to take him off the life support. And he was gone in a few minutes. But the music, it just kept on going. My morning has been a most wonderful experience. I was robbed of good morning with the death of my brother and my mother. All I felt was anger and misery. In this passing, I have been so gratefully enriched. I have found bones that he has hidden everywhere. Paintings I've never seen, sculptures I didn't know he made, recordings I didn't know that existed, friends I didn't know he had, lovers I met that I never knew about. Beautiful people came forward. And so, Light as a feather. Light as a feather. Yes. Light, light, light. as a feather. Ciao! you so much. This next gentleman I'm going to uh, ask to come up. Since the beginning, since I started uh, getting involved with the Macedonian community, he's been everywhere. Everywhere I'd go. If I went to the church, if I went to the CMP, if I went uh, to a dance, it was, Tony was always there. And now I find myself working with him at uh, Canadian Macedonian uh, Historical Society. By the way, the gala, the 25th uh, anniversary gala, is going to be on November the 12th at uh, St. Clement's. I'm trying to make it. Uh, this is a, a group that's really going to shoot into the future. History is, will become the future. So I want to introduce you to some of the hardest working guy. We finished the meeting around 10.30 at night, quarter to 11. We're all tired. We're all going to go home. I said, Tony, where are you going? He says, I'm going to work. Tony Markowski.
Thank you, John. I don't know where to start with because everything was said tonight. But I'll say, Ristos vos crece, Alec Gigoros vos crece. Tonight, we, vos, uh, we made him to, to be here. I can feel his breath. He is a man who cannot be forgotten. On the 3rd of May, when I heard that he passed away, something was traveling through my body and telling me that we have to do something. And it happened to be a meeting with Canadian Macedonian Historical Society that evening. So I informed the members, who most of them knew already, and I thought, if we do something, we have to appoint somebody who can do the job. And thank you to Virginia Evans. We appoint her and John Evans to make this night Alec Jigger to the Voskresni. Alec Džigerov беше не само познат како човек во вистинската смисла на зборот човек, но исто така тој беше и бранител за чување и почитување на, наша, на нашите корени. Еве што тој рече на еден од многуте посети во на Торонто. Тодека размислува за канадско македонското историско друштво, што значи за сите нас, овие мисли и зборови ми, и зборови ми падна на памет. И јас ви ги пренесувам на вас и до, од вас до други. Народ без сеќавање, без минато, е како цвеќе без корени, рече тој. Бидете како здравецот, кој што има долги корени, кои се протегаат надвор, назад, се до, до таму, се до од каде сме дошле и до нашата историја. Се има речено многу пати, ама пак може да се каже, вели тој, со кое парче, секој едно парче, кое вие го допридонесувате за канадско-македонското историско друштво, на било кој начин ке поможи за корените на аркулците да фатат корен во канадската земја. Запамтете, ако треба тие аркулци да растат, им е потребна вода. Навадете ги, ако сакате, ако треба и со солзи, за благодарност на сите оние кои не донесуат тука до ова место во ова време. Тоа беа зборовите на Алекс кои оставија длабок впечаток во мене и ја покажа правата цел на историското друштво на Канадско-Македонското историјско друштво, кое ние а, сакаме да се прошири и да се збогати со активности. Таа една активност е тоа што ние имаме должност да ги забележиме нашите активности, нашите веселби, нашите радости, а најдобро тоа ќе биде, како што видовте денес, со живот искажување на нашите животни истории, на нашите животни приказни. Тоа е една од најглавните точки на Канадско-Македонското историско душство и во, наред, и во последниве 20 години имаме направено преку 
сто снимки на наши кои веќе и не се тука, за да можат нивните генерации, нивните нивната челат да ги гледаме и сите заедно низ целиот свет. Алек Джигаров беше адвокат, сакаетрист, уметник, писател, глумец, ама пред се беше човек. Македонец длабоко се до неговата срш и го подкрепуваше и го ширеше македонизмот на секаде каде што бил, включувајќи и градот Јармаут во Нова Скоша. Таму тој живееше преку 40 години, како што се рече. Тој имаше истакната улога во изработката и представувањето на Оро Македонско во 1984 година и Оро Македонско наша Канада во градот Отава во 1993 година. Джигаров ги нацрта во боја зидните слики да мюралс во просториите во предсобјето и ходникот на Канадско-Македонското место и серија на уметнички слики во паранешното македонско крило дел во Лижа Уролд. Исто така напиша неколку книги. Најпозната негова книга му е Баб, Бабините македонски чорапи. Бабас Македонијан Сонс. Ава, Сокс. За... Да се зборува за Алек Джигоров има многу и како што видовте денес а, неговиот живот бил толку бурен, но и многу ексайдет, многу интересен, што не ти, ако слушаш за неговиот живот, не ти дава да бидиш, да ти биде досадно. Ми падна во, во очи крајот на неговата книга, која беше покажена тука, I want to learn Macedonian. На крајот на страницата, последната страница, тој кој изнесува резултатот на секој еден кој ќе прочита оваа книга и ќе научи неколку зборови, и му честита за тоа што го на, што научил. Но најважното што мене ми остави во печаток е последниот запис на долу после азбуката покажува дека има 31 буква. Што значи ако ние земиме што не знаеме да читаме македонски, три дена да научиме една буква За три месеци ќе знаеме да читаме. Тоа е што Алек го изнесува преку ова со почит, со љубов и почит кон својата култура. Тоа е една работа што јас би оставил за секој од нас да може да го пренесе на нашите нови генерации и да не го заборават не само на песната и орото, него да ги разбират песните со тоа што, ако го знаат јазикот, ќе знаат повеќе околу нашата историја. Пред во изнесувањето на Андреј, тој рече дека повтор... татко му повторувал, повторувал, 40 години повторувал, што значи да не заборави, а тоа доаѓа до поговорката, повторувањето е мајка на знаењето. Repeating is the mother of knowledge. So, да не должа многу, зашто ми беше дадено да зборувам само неколку минути, а има и други да зборуваат, но би ве подсетил да не заборавете на 12. ноември Канадско-Македонското историско друштво ќе прославува 25 години плодна и а, напорна работа 
Па дојдете да прославиме со таа прекрасна гала која ќе биде на 12. ноември во Свети Климент Охридски. Пред да завршам, ви сакал а, да ви сообщам дека there is a book from Alec Jigarov, The Sky and Stars Dance 2. We have 10 books signed by Alec Jigarov. And because the Canadian Macedonian Historical Society will live with donations and uh, membership dues, we will give to anybody who donate $100 or more our original book signed by Alec Jigarov to have it for your library. Now, because Alec Jigarov was uh, an artist, and to say the best for his work and to analyze it, it will be a mistake if we don't select a proper person to say that. The next person who is going to talk uh, is uh, an artist who has a, a world a uh, world-famous artist whose pictures and murals say, uh, they're all over the world, uh, especially in the frescoes in the um, Macedonian Orthodox Church St. Clements of Hochrit in Toronto and St. Demetrius of uh, Solon uh, Dimitrija Solunski in Markham. Beside that, he has uh, uh, there is a, a book, Artist Life, uh, who is available to to be purchased, and many many documentary movies, and that is Georgi Danevski. Почитувани присутни, ова е го велам со љубов почитувани за тоа што <laughs> дојдени сте да поздравите една екстраординарна личност во сакевањата на споменот на Алек Джигеров. Так е се овидам вак. А, и лесно и тешко е да се зборува за една таква импресивна природа како што беше Алек Джигеров. Имено јас во кратки црти ќе ја спомнам првата средба. Тоа се совпаѓа со мојот прв чекор во Канада во довагањето кога беше во Скайдом Оро Македонско. И а, таму видов еден виспарен, а, динамичен спикер на, на, на сцената кој со жар го крепеше македонскиот дух и интерпретираше пропагандно за стварање возрагање на македонската држава, тоа беше Джон Еванс, а потоа го запознав Алек Джигеров. А, Алек Джигеров ми остави присна, присна импресија затоа што беше спонтан човек. Јас сакам неколку зборови да кажам за неговата линија, за неговото разбирање на бојата, за неговиот однос кон уметноста, но повеќе би сакал да се задржам за а, неговата експресивна а, поетична душа, поетичен карактер. Тој апсолутно беше спонтан човек. Ако можам сето тоа да го соберам во неколку збора, би рекол дека беше еден прекрасен боем, алтруист, човеколубив и директен, но длабоко искрен човек. А ова ќе го илустрирам, бевме на една средба, нема да ја кажам, една иминентна личност која со демагогија и со едни материалистички погледи на светот зборуваше за некоја привремена политика. Но Алек Джигеров беше толку директен и му рече во целиот овој час што вие зборувате и правите 
некое убедување, јас повеќе научувам од штурчето во, во, до моето езеро за пет минути, отколку вие неколку часа што со демагогија а, а, го зборувате ова. Видов дека, дека е многу длабоко искрен и некомпромисен со, со, со а, луѓето кои го сваќа а, живото како пропаганда, политика или материјален свет. А, ние, на вистина, јас ке кажам и зашто ви реков почитувани присутни. Почитувани присутни ви реков затоа што е еден убав пезаж од луѓе сте овде кои се поклонувате на спомено на Алек Джигеров и колку би било тоа убаво да сме биле сите на некое негово отварање, на негова изложба, на негови дела, кога беше жив. Но животот прави такви, а, 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 такви иронији и сепак ние сме добитници, затоа што а, вие доваѓате со респект за еден човек, за една поетизирана природа, И а, јас имам голем респект за таквите луѓе како Али, Алек Джигеров, бидејќи дојдовме од а, една република која имаше известна слобода, но немаше уште дефинирана држава. А имавме четири драги, драги соседа кои агресивно а, не потискаа со, со векови и со десетици години. И доваѓајќи овде, првото сојузништо и првата подкрепа ја најдовме во диаспората. И луѓето, луѓето кои ги отворија срцата и не згасна македонскиот ген а, јасно и, и, и пламено да зборуваат и да ја покажат а, својата домо, до, домолюбива, родолюбива природа, тоа беше Алек Джигеров со своите пријатели и со програмот кој го направија многу македонци и тоа останува како историја. А, како уметник, тој има а, слободна линија, спонтана линија, како што живееше. Јас, ако сакам да направам една компарација а, на неговата личност како, како символизам, тој беше како руино вино, пријатен во друштво, до крај отворен. И, и кога ја слушав, мама ми купи шарени чорапи, Со истата песна еднаш ме испраќаше за Македонија го еден донац, каде го рецитираше потоа Филип и Александар во едно поголемо друштво. И се прашувам, замислете си, може ли една песна да стане историја? Тој фокусирајќи длабоко виде во македонскиот етнос една символика и една таймлес, едно што нема никој пат да, да додека трае светот, ке трае и нашиот дух, нашиот корен. Uh, јас сум многу благодарен на таквите личности кои, како Алек Джигеров, родини тука, uh, нивните родители од немило до недраго, од политика, од uh, uh, екзодуси, го правеле животот достоинствено и го задржале, го задржале она што, што треба да бидеме многу горди, да го почитуваме. Само тоа ваше присуство, што му одавате почит на тој прекрасен човек, кој еден класичен боем. Јас малку гледам такви боеми сега ни во Европа, ни во... Тоа се истинолјубиви луѓе. Истинолјубиви кои ни с целото своје разбирање за животот ја проточуваа својата љубов кон природата и кон луѓето ни зона што го знаеа. Никој пат тој не рече дека е лоер, никој пат не рече дека е едуциран меѓу обичните прости луѓе туку спонтано се понашаше и го зимаше делот од животот и го споделуваше со радост. А, но истино љубив и директен, како што спомнав, а, му рече јас од штурчето, повеќе научувам за пет минути отколку вашето двочасовно на една иминентна личност, што значи тој имаше естетски внатрешни критериуми. И се надевам дека тие кои имат делови од неговата, од неговата уметност, добро ќе ги чуват, зашто тоа е огледало и одразот на, 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 на вашата културна состојба во тоа време, тоа е дел од вас. Чувајте ги како драг спомен, како вредност, затоа што Алин Джигеров нема да се заборави. А, тие, а, тие луѓе кои толку искрено го сакаа својот народ 
и беа чудесно поштени луѓе во новата за право Алек Джигеров е канадеец, ама со длабоки искрени а, а, македонски корени. Нека му е вечен споменот и да носете го со пријатност тој прекрасен боем како руино вино. Јас толку ќе кажам за него. Georgi Danevski, what an amazing man. It's funny, you know, uh, when I used to listen to Macedonian, I used to go, oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just skits out here because I don't understand a word. And then I realized the Macedonian is the seventh oldest language of our civilization, of our world. And it is born out of wars, out of blood, out of love, out of life, out of christenings and weddings and deaths through since the ninth century. Uh, it competes with Hebrew and Farsi and all these incredible civilizations. So what you hear from Tony and from Georgi is the opera that goes on, the Macedonian civilization. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful language. Thank you for using it today. Oh, this, this next gentleman is about, is, is about uh, well, he's a wonderful, a wonderful guy. He's, um, I could rhyme off uh, his uh, board of directors meetings, his uh, KOA camps for uh, kids with cancer, and his United Appeal, his uh, Mohawk Inn, and uh, uh, that he is a very successful businessman, but he's also a wonderful house guest who started out the conversation saying, now you don't know me, John, but Alex Jigarov changed my life. Sean Sonier. Hello, everyone. Um, rather than using old fashioned paper, I'm sitting here with my little iPad with my notes on it. Um, I was invited to speak today, and I was delighted <clears throat> about the impact that Alex had upon me through my life growing up in Yarmouth. Uh, simply put, Alex, he did change my life. He was always very hungry to, I was very hungry to learn, and he was hungry to teach. And at a certain point, I was uh, able to reciprocate and, and, and help him from time to time, which was a great pleasure for me. That uh, picture in the red, the red hat, I took that picture about eight, uh, seven years ago in the summer, and I was so delighted to see it on the screen today, and uh, it brings back a lot of great memories. Um, to be clear, uh, there's nothing really Macedonian about me. Uh, oh, yes, there is. Well, okay. <laughs> Okay, it, it's actually, uh, I have to say that, now, this is funny, but my father and mother are here today. My dad was Jigs. I have to tell you that we always referred to Alex Jigaroff endearingly as Jig. Like, we just called him Jig. And so I'll refer to him today as Jig. And anyway, I have to, to tell you that... Um, well, there's much to say about a 40-year relationship and a friendship uh, in five minutes. Um, I decided to boil it down to the Ten Commandments of Jake. <laughs> and uh, so number one was to be humble and understated. I'm still working at that. But for, for example, he used to say all the time, Sean, there are far too many artists and not enough painters. <laughs> History may give me the title of artist one day. Number two, be a voice for those without a voice. He did so through his writing, his speeches, and in particular, his painting and murals. There is a picture coming up, I think, of a mural on Main Street in Yarmouth. 
Oh, that's my lovely wife. <laughs> I'll get there. Okay. <clears throat> the reason I bring up that um, mural, uh, I wanted you to say that on the main streets in Yarmouth, on side streets, in the Mi'kmaq Native Community Reserve, in the public schools, and here in Toronto, as it was earlier referenced at the Macedonian Seniors Residence, he captured the history of people, and through his vast research, he gave it back through his visuals. And my, as I mentioned, my folks are here today, which is just, it's lovely for them to be here from Yarmouth for this. Um, my, my wife, Bridget, is here, and our four adult kids, uh, Emily, uh, Hannah, Jonathan, and, and I'd also like to point out my eldest son, uh, his name is Alex. We had thought of calling him Jig, but we, uh, we decided to not do that. Oh yeah. Uh, see, this is literally right, right in the main area in our community in Yarmouth, and there is more than I can tell you about this, but I am very, very pleased to point out uh, when we named our son after him, he literally, right in the middle of the picture is me with Alex on my shoulders. <laughs> and there's a great story behind that. Three, eat, drink, love, Dance and play was always on the wall in Andre's dad's wall in his house. He would, uh, he would say, never trust anyone that doesn't like food. <laughs> he would say, just try it. You don't have to eat it. Four, how you uh, learn how to listen. He repeated that to me over and over and over for a good reason, I'm sure. Learn how to listen and how to keep people's attention. Sometimes late at night, uh, after a couple drinks, Jig would doze off while I was still talking. And I learned that all I had to say was, to get his attention, Macedonia. <laughs> That's like Greece. <laughs> oh, he'd be awake. And you survived. Oh, I, just to wake him up. Of course, I had already received many, many hundreds of hours of lessons on Macedonia and the history and blah, blah, blah. Number five was do not be paralyzed by perfection. Just do it. He was painting a set for an upcoming musical of The King and I, and I walked in, and I always wanted to play the drums, and there was no drummer. Now, I had no idea how to play the drums. He didn't care. Andre's mom was a musical director, and, 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 and Jig said, just do it. And so I fumbled through with your mom's help, and, and I am now a drummer. <laughs> Six, dig your well before you're thirsty. Jig, like Chris Pallier, did I see you over there? Decided that we needed to establish protections here in Canada for Macedonians. Now, John didn't mention in my introduction, but you are looking at the first commander of the Macedonian Reserve Army of Nova Scotia. You're not allowed to laugh at my hat. It was a gift from Jig, and it was the best that he could do, even though it looks like a Turkish knockoff. 
he had a local person make it in Yarmouth, and this is the way it came out. This, he gave this to me for my dubbing ceremony at Little Halfway, which was the, the cottage and house where he lived uh, in, uh, for several years. And that's where a lot of our, a lot of the late night chats would be. Number seven, you heard an echo of this earlier today. Make a great day. He said over and over, Sean, you just don't have great days. You have to make them. We've all adopted that. All of the, I think my entire family uses that all the time on our voice messages. <laughs> Number eight, don't take care. Live dangerously. Other people mentioned this today, but I'm going to tell you, I think I know where that may have started. Lucy Jarvis was a famous maritime painter and uh, 86 years old. I was at the place, Jig invited her for dinner, and it was a stormy night. And I listened to those two talk all night. Fascinating evening. As she packed up to leave, she was at the door. He had tried to convince her to stay. Jig made the error of saying, Lucy, take care. And she spun around with her finger like this and said, don't you ever tell me to take care. You tell me to live dangerously. And he used that phrase for, rest of, I think, the rest of his life. Right? Number nine, how you say hello and how you say goodbye are two of life's most important things. Jig taught me a few Macedonian words and phrases that I could use to say hello and goodbye before I set off to Toronto at 19 or 20 to stay with Vera. My first night in Toronto was with Vera and Don. They picked me up in the worst snowstorm in 30 years, waited with me for four hours while my bags were supposed to come, and never ever did. I got a gift certificate from Air Canada three years later. <laughs> Everything was lost. He told me to stand up as part of my dinner. Sean, after you stand up from a good Macedonian meal, you look your hosts in the face with outstretched arms, and you say, Sakam Jaina. He did the same to me when I came to see them. Did he? He all the dirty words. No, he did. He said to me, okay. Now, now you greet them and you say, Lina, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe, now he told me that Sakam Jaina just meant, I want a woman, right? And so I'm like 20 years old. Anyway, I did that. And, and Vera may remember, Don laughed and laughed and laughed. He thought that was pretty funny. Number 10. <laughs> He said, Sean, don't lose hope in justice. I'm looking over there at Barry, Judge, uh, Judge Barry. Um, I know that there was no one, I think, that meant, uh, that gave more hope to law reform to him than you. He talked about you every time I was with him. I always get an update on Barry. Pardon me? Uh, so, uh, let me just say that this idea of hope is displayed. So don't lose hope in justice. This idea of hope was displayed in the serigraph silkscreen print that he created as part of a series on criminal justice. In case you can't find it, I brought it. <laughs> I brought this painting with me, and it's been in about 33 different offices all over the world that I've worked in, and I always brought it. It's part of the deal. And it's always remind me much of, of Jig's, a lot of the essence. It was a, 
I should just keep to my note here. I think it's one of his most important pieces as it sums up a collision between his two key passions of law reform and his art. And there is hope depicted in this, in this piece. I mean, there's a lot to be said about it, and if you want to talk about it after, see it later. But I can tell you that right here, all this white, that was Jig's hope that that even though the scales of justice, there's a double-edged sword, there was no certainty. And that, but he always said that justice is a long way off and hope is a long way off, but it's there. And so I know that he saw a lot of that hope in, in you. And I know that you're speaking after me, so I'm not gonna say much more, but it's nice to see you today. So Jig told me that our lives are so important that we all matter, whatever we do, that we can impact positively or negatively two generations ahead and two generations behind. He positively impacted this Acadian boy and his children and his parents and I expect the reverberations will continue to bounce ahead in our future generations. I'd also like to thank all of you for your contributions to his life because your investments in him were very well spent indeed as he magnified and multiplied everything that he was given. He gave back and he kept giving of himself until it was his end. That's what I have to say. Of this country, it changed attitudes. He continues to astonish by his commitment to these ideas. I got to know him through Peace Builders, the wonderful organization that uh, Evo Marshevsky and Chris Pallier uh, have been conducting for quite a long time. And uh, it's my pleasure. He just, he flew in from the wilds of Paradise Valley, British Columbia. And when I said what we were doing, he said, I'll be there in a heartbeat. Uh, please welcome Judge Barry Stewart, retired. Not a Macedonian. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, I am. I wore a kilt with Alex once, a very fancy ball, a very fancy place in, in downtown Ottawa. He wouldn't tell me what he had under his kilt, and I wouldn't tell him. <laughs> and thank God he didn't show me. <laughs> so everybody up here has been thanking Alex for their life. I want a person for mine. I had my life all planned out. There I was in 1967 in second year law, and Alex and, another, and his partner Hans Moller show up. In Queens Law School, very set back, very sedate, and in comes Alex, right? Bushy hair, bushy eyebrows, ready to take us all on. And he did take us on. And since 1967, both Alex and Hans, we cherish friends. <laughs> he taught me to cry. Alex did teach me to cry. Because when you're a judge, you don't show your emotions. That damn Alex forced me to cry. It led me, I think, for the very first time to be able to be a person as a judge. Because Alex always let it all hang out, literally. <laughs> and I had to do the same. So Alex had a fabulous, brilliant career going for him in law. And then one day he just said to me, I'm done. My first passion is art, and I'm gone. 
And he loaded up his family, Andre, Lex, Vivian, and off they went to Yarmouth. Yarmouth! Jesus, at least you could go to somewhere in Ontario where I could see you from time to time. <laughs> Yarmouth. But I want to tell you, I, drove, I dragged him out of, out of Yarmouth a couple of times, and then one time I, I drew him out of there. He was going to be the lecturer in my last lecture in a class that I gave at the University of Waterloo. It was a two-week intensive course. It was an experiment that the University of Waterloo was doing. It was on environmental law. Now, Alex's main suit in those days was sexual offenses, forensic evidence in the law, so on and so forth. So he wasn't really well scooped in the kind of law that I was teaching at that time. But he was willing to come. So I kind of baited the students all the way through the two weeks there's this guy coming, and he's going to give our last lecture, and he's a bit of a genius. He's cursed with his genius, and for me, Alex really reflected his genius. You know, he had brilliant ideas, and he had ideas that were off the wall. And the genius that he was, he never knew which ones were good and which ones were bad. <laughs> so I warned him about what was happening, and uh, he came. And uh, he was supposed to speak for 45 minutes. He spoke for almost an hour and a half or more. And I was sitting at the back of the classroom, so I couldn't really read the faces very much. But there was laughter, there was some crying, there was some, some stony silence. So I didn't really know what was happening. Finally, finally, he finished. And right after this, the last class, we were going to have a kind of a cocktail party next door. So I walk up to the class, there's no, no, and I thank Alex very much for what he's done, and nothing. There was just nothing. So I figured, oh boy, my friend Alex has really bombed. He has really bombed this time. And so I start doing a few little logistics, and I'm just about to say, let's go next door, and we'll have this little party. Feeling really badly in my heart for Alex, because I think he's bombed. The student said, wait, 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 wait. He stands up, and he says, I've been at university for six years. I'm now in my last year of getting my second degree. I came to university to be challenged. I came to university to be motivated. What the hell is this guy doing in my class? I'm about to finish, and this is the first time I've ever been motivated and challenged. And he started clapping. Before a second went by, the whole class was standing, clapping, hooting, and just having a terrific time and saying over and over again, thank you, thank you, thank you, Alex. The party next door, which was supposed to be over in an hour, because I only had enough stuff for an hour worth of these, for these students, about 60 of them, lasted until well after midnight. <laughs> then, yeah, of course. <laughs> the next year, I did it once again, and I had Alex again come for the last lecture. When we finished, when we got to the last afternoon for the last lecture, we spent another 30 minutes trying to find space for all the other students that came. Because the word had been out, people raved about his lecture, everybody wanted to come. In fact, a few professors came to hear what a really good university lecture was like. That was Alex when you combine his genius and his passion. He had, when you, those both were working without the booze, it was amazing what he could produce. So I think we're telling stories about Alex from all over the place. I'm going to tell one more. But first I want to, have you got the painting? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I just want to see, uh, the, the, uh, Which one, sir? The three paintings. Yeah. With a professional producer we've got here. Oh, no, that's not, there you go, okay. okay. It doesn't matter which one you go to first, doesn't matter. No, that's fine. That's Okay, so this is this is the same painting that Sean talks about, the very same painting. It's a print, sir, yeah. Oh, oh shit, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> you must be a lawyer for God's sake, right? <laughs> no, okay. I'm artist. You know, so, this was a long night after a really difficult discussion. Now. None of my discussions with Alex were easy, right? And I'm sure everybody knows that. They were tough. 
and they were we were yelling at each other before the night was over. And why I curse Alex is, as I say, I was all ready to be a litigator. I just wanted to go to law school, and I wanted to take on the bad guys. Well, Alex and Hans Moore together did a two-team on me that they didn't even know. The party only got me in court for about a year, and then I was gone. And this is one of the paintings that came out of a big discussion with Alex when I was saying, I don't want to be a lawyer that makes somebody stand on the cry on the stand. I want to do something that's much more positive and much more constructive. And so we were talking about the justice system, and you can see this is a gold bar, okay? And his notion was, we talked about money is more important than whatever this is over here. For him, this was the misery of a poor who get caught up. The non-property classes get caught up in the justice system, and it's, it's, it's clouded by this myth that comes out of this thing, which is all the complexity of the law. If we could only just use common sense, we could do an awful lot better in the law. And that lesson, for me, led me, ultimately, as, as a judge, to get off the bench and sit down in the cases and deal with the cases as a community. And give the community an opportunity, which Alex always said, was to give the community an opportunity to be a community by doing the hard moral work of the community. Let them make the decisions about what happens to the youth that are in trouble. Let them make the decisions about the people who are hurt by crime. Let them get involved, because in getting involved in the community, we're going to create justice. By getting involved in those laws, we were never going to create justice. Next, next painting, Alex. I love having these paintings in my home, by the way, because people look at them and say, what's this about? Well, this is the tin can of worms. So Alex's notion was that the justice system was so long dead from justice that like anything has been dead for a long time, the only thing in it is a bunch of worms. Very powerful notion by people understanding that where is the justice when I go to the justice system? It's been a long, long time dead, and what we have is worms. That's the last one. Okay, so when I went to got a point to the bench, this was Alex's uh, idea of what I might look like. But <laughs> 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 a small notion what he was trying to tell me is never be so self important that you think you're the most important thing that's happening in the court. Right? Do not dress like this. Do not take on the airs. Set yourself down and be much more a human being. As I say, it was Alex that got me to be able to try. I never ever cried in court. In fact, what I used to say in court, when I would see somebody crying, oh gee, let's take a break. Right? What did that mean to that person? No crying in my court, right? I was trying to say something fundamentally different, but that's how it came out to end. And so when I started the circles and got the cry in my own circles, and, and, and honoring and respecting the huge emotion was there, I always remembered my friend here, who I did not want to be. <laughs> so Alex lived in many different places, did many different things, and touched all of us in many different ways. I mean, what an amazing individual this guy was. When we were both in, when we were both in, uh, at, uh, in London, England, he doing his PhD, me doing my master's in law, um, many different things happened, including at Scapos, where Andre is here now, but Andre and I and Lexi had this Ho Chi Man Jigger Man Cheryl, which we developed. Remember? Yeah, it's true. And uh, on your shoulder. Yeah. Alex was somebody that you couldn't go anywhere and just have a nice little vacation. When you went with Alex anywhere, he was the vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you basically didn't let anything go by that was an opportunity that could be for fun. So when I was at, uh, when I was, when we were at the university, we were together. We went to the Canadian Embassy that had this lovely night for Canadian students. And it was a lovely place because they had free booze and free food. <laughs> so I 
I really wanted that night to go and hear the international debate that was going on in London House between Bernadette Devlin, who was this fiery Irish parliamentarian, and the three head members of the English Cricket Society over whether or not the English people should boycott the South African cricket team over Harvey. And so Bernadette Devlin was taking the position that it's such a bad regime, we have to use every opportunity we have to bring sanction to it and to be able to deny the capacity of it to grow. But the cricket people were going to be arguing, of course, that no, 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 no politics in sports. So I wanted to escape from this, and you can imagine the kind of debate that Alex was having about Canadian politics and everything else with all the other Canadian students there. I wanted to sort of sneak out go to this debate. Alex catches me sneaking up and says, where are you going? And I'm going to the debate. He says, you can't go without me. You can't take on all those British folks in the debate without me. You obviously need me. Well, Alex is a free loser. I know it's a tough decision to have to make. <laughs> I'm going with you. <laughs> so we get to the London House. We're a little late arriving. The debate's already going full tilt. And there's a big stage up on top. Uh, three feet higher, four feet higher than this, and Bernadette Devlin's on one side, and the three English folks are on the other side. And it's quite clear that every time that Bernadette Devlin tries to make a point, she's pissed and booed. Standing room only, we're at the very back. We're not there four minutes, and, and Alex says, Wish, wish me well. <laughs> <laughs> And his hair going in the same with his arms like this, the big bushy eyebrows. But Alex was the consummate actor. He was speaking in an overblown English accent, <laughs> way over the top, uh, using a vocabulary that only a private English student could get. Right? So he was mocking them and, and brilliantly making points on behalf of Bernadette and in the argument. I'm going, oh God, how much sure do you need me to have? He gets up to the stage here. The audience is right there, much bigger than this. And he leans up against the stage, printed that thumb straight up there, and he says to her, and he finishes his rant, he says to her, I'm on your team, how are we doing? <laughs> and she says, she says to him, I don't know, Laddie, I don't know whether you're in my side or nay. <laughs> you're sure putting on a good performance. <laughs> I gotta say, in Alex's defense, he was brilliant. <laughs> Clearly was brilliant. And he had them just stunned. They didn't know whether they had a new debater or a madman. <laughs> they didn't know what this guy was called. So he walks back up and he says to me, How'd I do? You know, I said, I don't know how you did, but we gotta get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that there has been a few great, great characters in my life. And Alex sits right up there at the top of all those great, great characters. I was not able to be me, this dour Scotsman, couldn't stay, you know, just being me. Alex was after me all the time, pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. And I try to engage Alex as often as I can. I lost his voice in the prominent sort of battles for justice in this country because our degrees are over the fact. But you can see that, that and, and uh, as Sean does and I do, I mean, we, we carry arts, the art that Alex has given us, the, the art that he left on the mural walls of, in, in Yarmouth, the art that's now, I hope, in a hundred different Canadian homes, because I have made prints of that thing, by the way, and every time that somebody is looking at me, particularly young students who come to me when I was teaching, particularly young students, I would say, look at this. And in every one of Alex's pictures, prints, you can say when you're looking at it that you see something different every single time. And I think that's the blessing of Alex. Cool.
I fired the slide uh, operator, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it myself. Um, it's a longer program than we figured, but God knows he deserves it. Um, and in closing, I just want to say that uh, we should appreciate we should appreciate our artists more. And uh, I want to point out Nikola Bachevsky, uh, who's a wonderful artist. Who these people are known uh, throughout the world, most of them, and we don't know them in our own community. This is Michael Close. Uh, he's he's showed all over the world, and uh, and we really have to support them. Now this fellow uh, has created. This is Chesky, who was playing the accordion, so stunning. <laughs> and uh, your improvisation, Chesky, underneath uh, Andre's uh, beautiful piece of work, was, it was really, I'm glad we have it on, uh, on video now, because that'll be a classic. Uh, but he, uh, he created um, the opera, what did you call it, an opera or a symphony, uh, Chesky? Uh, the, the Palace at Pella, uh, about the uh, kingdom of Philip. It's really a knockout. It's a two-disc set, and uh, he's an incredibly talented guy. I'm so happy to work with him. And, uh, and this is a, a portrait that Andre made of him just the other night. And uh, <laughs> uh, so this is the Palace of Pella um, idea. Virginia Stoymanoff, uh, if there is an artist, and if there is any art in diplomacy, and the idea of keeping our crazy Balkan community together. This is a work of art that Virginia Stoymanov does so incredibly well. And through all the years, oh, she, has, she has a ready smile, she has a touch of irony, a quick wit, and the instincts of a jungle cat. So look out, and Virginia, just keep holding us together, please. We absolutely love you. And another, Another stunning person. God, we have some amazing people in our community. Another stunning person in our community uh, has been teaching a dance for about 60 years and is still, still so incredibly vital. She is in the company. She is in the company of Veronica Tennant, Margaret Atwood, uh, some of the greatest artists of our country, and she is included in that list. Ladies and gentlemen, Olga Sandalwich. wonderful, wonderful stories about Alex today. Many of the stories we do not know. Some of us were involved just on the edges of Alex. I want to take you back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I know I have a, I, my voice carries. I have a stage whisper. <laughs> I want to take you back to 1957 when I first met Alex. Um, I had just finished teaching at a Macedonian and Bulgarian center which had just sold their premises. And I was looking for a new place to teach. So I went to St. Cyril's, met Alex, and I said, okay, I'm offering my services to work with young people at the church. And he says, I'll take it to the committee. Fine. One year passes, I hear nothing. I meet Alex at a party at the Yugoslav consulate at that time. And I said, and he's had a few drinks. I said, Alex, I haven't heard from you. What is the decision? I've offered my services to come and teach folk dancing at the church. He said, well, you know, it's like this. And it was like this because Olga was a peacenik. She was an activist. She was out on the streets getting petitions signed to ban the bomb. <laughs> and the church found this unacceptable because I was a pinko. And Alex, I said, 
what has this got to do with culture? I am coming to work with young people to teach young people. Finally, he came back and I was hired. We formed a little dance group. And I have to tell you that this is very important because one of the first people to join this dance group, there I can't see you, where are you? <laughs> Alex Sister. And also Jim Vassoff, who was a very, very dear friend of ours. Yeah. Yeah. And I will tell you that they didn't work on four cylinders, six cylinders, they worked on 12 cylinders. With this group, we were invited to perform at the CNE grandstand. We had only been together for maybe three months. They brought in the musician that was going to play for us. That happened to be Ivan Romanov. Ivan Romanov, who was a student of Chris Dafet, who was a Macedonian. And many Macedonians don't know of this amazing man. He taught some of the greatest musicians that joined the Toronto Symphony. And this is still connected with Alex. We're not moving from Alex. And uh, Ivan Romanov said, if you do this dance first and do this one second, because they can't get the rhythm, we will elect Chris Dafet as mayor. And Alex was there. And so the performance went on, but we moved on from the CNE grandstand to 1958, a concert at St. Cyril with Alex in charge, with Jim in charge, and also a third one, Lenny Doncha. And some of you might know. And I tell you, working with that trio was unbelievable. And the ideas, you couldn't keep up. Mind you, it was very difficult for me to keep up. I'm trying to teach dancing and I'm about eight months pregnant. <laughs> they thought for sure I'd give birth on the stage. But what an exciting time because it not only brought those three together, it brought another talent from the Macedonian community that nobody had heard of. His name was John Bailey and he formed a folk orchestra. He happened to have been the principal of the North Toronto Conservatory and an examiner across Canada. Macedonian, do we know these Macedonians? They're hidden everywhere. And through this concert with Alex, with Jim and with Lenny and all these people put together, it was the most successful Thing that had ever been done and I think it was the beginning when you look at when Alex was born how old he would have been there the same with Jim Vassoff and Lenny Downship they were mid-20s mid-20s and they were so inspired about their roots and I'm very strong about my roots by the way my name is Veloff Sandal which I'm a Macedonian through and through so that was another beginnings but I must tell you, it was through Alex that this dance group was formed at St. Cyril's. I was never ever mentioned in their books as having taught there for 13 years because I was a pinkle. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I never regret what I did in my life to be out there trying to save the world. And if you think Macedonians aren't known, they are known everywhere. Because Baba's Macedonian socks, I promoted, and I think people can tell you, I sold so many of the books. But I sent a copy of the book to the folk dance historians in Austin, Texas. And they did a review of the book. It's a short review, but I think you should hear it. I think everybody here should have this book. I don't care whether you have children, grandchildren, or whatever. No children, you should have this book. Here is the review. You will not read this book quickly. You will remember your grandparents. You will give this book to a young friend 
or relative with the forlorn yearning that they will understand. This tale of generations haunts those with sufficient life experience to appreciate tra tradition and family. I suggest that you buy this book for yourself and then leave it as a legacy to your grandchildren. Drawings that capture the wildness of the Balkans will capture them and perhaps they will remember. I recently spoke to a Nova Scotia dance friend and I said, do you remember the book, Baba's Macedonian Socks? She bought it for her daughter and her daughter was an artist. They loved the artwork, then they loved the book. I said to her, do you still have that book? And she says, it's out every day. I read it to my grandchildren. <laughs> so this is how we spread the word about who we are as Macedonians. Never be shy uh, about saying you are a Macedonian. And I have friends that say they want to be Macedonians. Uh, anyway, I, I know that I only have a minute to speak. So here's another event in my life that brought Alex closer and closer. It was in um, 1990. I taught at dance uh, workshops in Nova Scotia just about every summer up until 1995. And I was in touch with Alec, and I said, Alex, we're going to be very close to Yarmouth. We're going to be in St. Anne's at the university there. I said, well, why don't you come? Why don't you come and see what these dance workshops are all about? So Alex came, and um, let me just read you the first few lines of an article that he wrote after he came to this uh, uh, dance workshop. He says, no one would expect to find people learning to do a Macedonian auto at the University of St. Anne at Church Point, Nova Scotia. But it's true. I saw it with my own eyes. There is an amazing unofficial Macedonian, Canadian Macedonian ambassador who teaches Macedonian dances, customs, food, culture. She goes um, wherever she goes. Olga Belov's Andology, which she says, I walked into the university gymnasium. I saw 40 people, men and women, ages 14 to 16, 60, doing a Macedonian oro. The music, cabal crying out in song, drum throbbing, the class joined into small chains, beating out the rhythm with light footed steps and stamping feet. Now, here again, We've taken our music, our dance, our culture. It's, uh, it is about academia as well. It is about law. It is about many things. And we sometimes, as Macedonians, take our culture too lightly. We refer to the beautiful outfits that the women embroidered as costumes. And we look at them and we shrug our shoulders. Oh, yeah, they're very colorful. They're very pretty. I want you to look a little more deeply. You've heard how Alex felt about his being Macedonian, how he believed in right from wrong, how he believed in speaking out. I want you to think about that and be proud of the Macedonian heritage. Look at those costumes, appreciate what the women did. When you hear the music and people dancing, Look at the joy that there is, and as Alex said, it's a bit of wildness when we dance, and it is wild. I went to an event the other night, and when about 400 got, people got up and started dancing, they were wild, and they were Macedonian. Somehow, through dance, they can let loose whatever they're feeling, and through dance, uh, there's so much understanding. If you hear the songs and listen to the words of the songs, and this is what Alex was talking about through his books, through what his writings and everything. So dance is very important to who we are 
The songs are our history. Listen carefully. And with those few words, I'm going to say, Zivce, where are you? <laughs> because uh, I believe, <laughs> um, I believe <laughs> I have said uh, what my feelings are. Like Alex said, your Macedonianism is in your heart. And it's in my heart. Okay. <laughs> Just, uh, hang on, Olga, because you're going to lead us out in, a, in an order. You're going to lead us out. You're going to lead us out in an order. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You've heard some wonderful people today. Uh, eclectic, and uh, it gives you an idea of the incredible scope of uh, Alex Jigorov. But he's ours. Okay. Um, and, and so are you. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is ask you. Um, Zivke is going to play the accordion. And I'm going to start the procession and lead you all out into the next room. So um, he's playing. Come. Thank you very much. The painting is for sale, and there are many artifacts to buy that will contribute to the Canadian Macedonian Historical Society. Now we go to Oro, just next door at the cafeteria. Thank you very much. <laughs>